Fanland video blog for books that came out on July 1st, 2009. As always, I'm Craig, your host. That means we're halfway through this year. Uh, there's been some very interesting books out and plenty more interesting ones to come. Uh, this is a really light week, though. Uh, after a huge week last week, where there's really only 10 books to talk about, so there will only be two installments here. This one will have your Marvel books. Part two will have four DC books and one indie book. So let's get right down to it. A little departure from the show. We're going to tackle cable number 16. Um, Dwayne Swierzynski has been going on this book pretty much since the start, if I remember correctly. And now Paul Gulacy is on the art uh, as the team has kind of rotated. Ariel Olivetti, uh, Ariel Olivetti was on this book for a while, and then some other people have taken over. And uh, this is this is one that's a favorite of my boss, so I'm sure he's going to be really excited that I'm actually reviewing it. Uh, I was curious mostly because a there weren't a lot to pick from this week, but also because. The um, Messiah War had wrapped up recently, and I was curious where this book was going to head to. Uh, Hope is now 11 years old and uh, running away from Cable, <laughs> so they're split up, and that's kind of really where this book picks up. Cable and Hope are split up chronologically in time. Uh, Hope is in the past from Cable, and Cable can only go forward. And uh, all the while, Lucas Bishop is still chasing after the kid, uh, either to kidnap or kill or, or whatever Bishop's, Bishop's going to do. And the evolution of Bishop as a character, even though it's been done in some really bad books, has been a very interesting evolution because he's, he's really an interesting guy uh, from top to bottom. I really liked him when he was a hero, obviously, when he was a cop in District X, and now from there, like, it led directly into Civil War X-Men, where he kind of sided with the government, kind of became you know, the, uh, the mutant heel and kind of became an evil mutant leading up to Messiah Complex where he had a full-blown, you know, just straight-out villainy going on, as it seems like. So this book is really well done. Uh, you don't really have to know too much about Cable's current setting to jump on right here. The Messiah War is over, so it's a good jumping on point. Um, there's, of course, the one-page recap, so you're all set uh, right there, you know, if you read the one-page recap. And Paul Galassi is still an excellent artist, you know, all these years. He's still just turning out some really good stuff, very underrated. So this is very interesting if you like uh, the characters of Cable and Bishop and the idea of, you know, the idea of those two, not really necessarily going into, you know, the full, full on X-Men stuff, but even just the idea of Cable and Bishop, it pays off pretty well here. Next up, you'd have to be living in a cave if you did not know this came out. And if you're living in a cave, tell Obama, or, uh, Osama Bin Laden we said hi. Captain America Reborn, number one of five, Brubaker and Brian Hitch. And really, I can't help but say, let me tell you a little story about Ed Brubaker on Captain America. When Brubaker's Captain America started, I didn't know who Ed Brubaker was. And they said, well, he's bringing back Bucky. And I said, that's never going to work. And I went in there and I looked, and sure enough, Bucky was coming back. It was suspended animation and cybernetics and all of this fancy stuff. And I was like, all right. You know, that kind of ties into Captain America because cybernetics and suspended, well, suspended animation in particular, you know, but I don't buy, I don't believe cybernetics is, is too far out, you know, to suspend disbelief. Uh, so I'll, I'll believe it, you know, here comes Bucky, he comes back and he's kind of a bad guy, but he's trying to become a good guy. And then uh, people kind of said, well, they're going to kill Captain America. And, and a lot of people doubted and said, what's the point of killing Steve Rogers? That's never going to work. Sure enough, it worked. Uh, and then we had a bunch of, you know, 17 issues of all sorts of weird mind wiping and brainwashing and, you know, the Red Skull. And again, nothing was out of the ordinary. Then there was a fake Captain America created by the Red Skull. And it was nothing out of the ordinary. It's, it was firmly rooted in what had been done with Captain America d during the Grunewald years, in the 80s, going back to the 70s, the 60s, the suspended animation stuff. You know, nothing has really taken this savage left turn. It's all kind of been, you know, this science fiction-y for a character who's not really science fiction-y. Uh, you know, this, these science fiction elements and, and developed all these different things. You know, resurrecting Bucky, killing Cap, play, replacing Bucky, or replacing Cap as Bucky, you know. And we get to Captain America Reborn, and we're told that he is unstuck in time. Now, yes, that's obviously, uh, you know, a Vonnegut Slaughterhouse Five reference, but at the same time, uh, calling something unstuck in time and then saying that somebody that he loves is his constant is just smacks way too much of just stealing Lost's uh, milieu for Desmond Hume and uh, Penny. Uh, if you follow Lost, you know that Desmond and Penny in this character, you know, Desmond kind of travels through time or is kind of un unstuck in time but he has to make contact with his constant to re-stick himself in time and his constant of course is the love of his life 
that doesn't belong in a Captain America book. It does. It simply doesn't. I don't care how beautifully Brian Hitch and Butch Geist do it. It doesn't belong in a Captain America book. Brubaker had misses the mark, in my opinion. As fun as it is to see Falcon and Sharon Carter and Bucky and Vision and Hank Pym all interact, you know, and to see you know these characters going from the New Avengers to the Mighty Avengers to get Hank Pym to help them. As fun as that all is, I just can't suspend disbelief long enough to believe that Captain America is being treated like Desmond from Lost. It's that simple, and that's why this misses the mark with me. And we're just gonna we're just gonna kind of float it out over here and and put it in suspended animation and sail it off into the night because we don't really care about that book anymore. Let's go on to bigger and better things. Daredevil Noir number four. This book has been rocking, and unfortunately, it's had the uh, distinction of sharing noir time as it is you know since noir books come out two at a time sharing space with wolverine and wolverine noir has been hands down the best noir story they've told but this is still a really good story had an excellent twist at the end of number three and number four kind of wraps up uh telling the rest of that twist and explaining the end of the fight and then we get the final scene which is something of a letdown in my opinion because it is true daredevil and kingpin are always destined to be at each other's throats, but it doesn't need to be the final scene. You know, Daredevil and Kingpin at each other's throats, da-da, and an anticlimactic ending. Uh, I feel that, you know, it's a brave decision to make. It, it didn't work for me, but I think that, I think that there's some respect there as well. So it's, it's tough for me to really say too much negative about it, but at the same time, I understand why they went that way, because it is kind of epic or timeless in the, in the Daredevil mythology. Uh, still an excellent, well-written book. Looks beautiful, the whole thing. You know, another, another noir success from Marvel. But uh, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about the ending for sure. So kind of in the middle on the ending. Deadpool Merc with a Mouth number one starts up this week. Bong Dazo is back drawing it, uh, if you remember his work on the Thunderbolts crossover. And Victor Gishler is writing it. And I have no idea who that is, but let me tell you how hard it is to write a Deadpool book. My old friend Brad Blankenship could do it. Yeah. Arthur Soidum cover, which is fun. Deadpool is uh, hired by uh, AIM, or as he sees it, when we get a panel of how he sees it, uh, a bunch of beekeepers. And uh, he's supposed to extract something from the Savage Land. And he says, I'll do it for a million dollars and some honey. And they're kind of looking at him like, what? You know, but, but Deadpool's delusion makes this book. It's very interesting. Obviously, he goes into the Savage Land and he finds out that the cavemen are being led by his zombie disembodied head. <laughs> and that's the package he's supposed to extract. Well, in the meantime, there's also an AIM scientist who's supposedly like this super hot chick wearing like Daisy Duke jungle cutoffs. And, and Deadpool's really going to have a lot of fun with that. So, uh, again, it's an easy book. It's an easy book to write. It's an it's easy book to love and to read and excellent all the way around. But it doesn't take a lot of skill, but it doesn't matter. It's still very good, very fun, nice little romp. I don't know if Deadpool really needed two series, but if they're both going to be really good and really fun, I can't really complain that much. Lastly, we're going to end on Uncanny X-Men 513, Utopia Chapter 2. And <sighs> this is rough because... It's Matt Fraction making moderate sense. You know, there's, there's some interesting stuff going on here. Uh, Norman Osborn has replaced the X-Men with his own X-Men, his own hand-picked X-Men. And um, some rogue mutants are striking against the Dark Avengers and the Dark X-Men, even though Cyclops is trying to tell them not to. Uh, it definitely reads like part two of a seven-part crossover, which is exactly what it is. Um, remarkably well put together despite the negative things I've said about Uncanny X-Men recently. So uh, a pleasant surprise, Terry Dotson's art of course always works when it's, when it's firing on all cylinders, when we don't have to worry about Greg Land coming in and messing it up. Um, Matt Fraction, hit or miss sometimes, but not a bad job here. Uh, it's, it's good structure, it's, it's moving where it needs to move. There's no you know, tiny moments that kind of puncture or uh, punctuate it and make it a little better, but it's just kind of average it makes it to where it needs to be. That's definitely what, that's, what this book does. And that's, that's really all they needed to do. So that's it for this installment. We'll see you in part two with some DC stuff. Thanks for watching.